In an effort to preserve the history of the Society for Vascular Surgery and Vascular Surgery as a distinct specialty, the leadership of SVS initiated an interview series featuring leaders and major contributors in the field of vascular surgery. The research and actual production of the interviews took place in a variety of locations guided by the History Project Work Group, chaired by Dr. James Yao. With the participation of nine members, including Drs. William Baker, Ken Cherry, Mark Eskenderi, Roger Gregory, Melina Kibbe, Peter Lawrence, Walt McCarthy, William Pierce, Norman Rich, and Cal Ernst, serving as a consultant. The content of this video has been drawn from interviews conducted by the History Project Work Group, begun in September 2011 with the interview of Dr. Denton Cooley. Direct excerpts from 49 of these interviews are included in this history. The selection criteria considered subjects' importance in the development of vascular surgery via presidency of SVS, ISCVSNA, and AAVS, as well as SVS award recipients, honorary members of SVS, and selected contributors to the specialty. Before considering the history of the SVS, we'd like to take a look at the origins of the techniques that evolved into the specialty of vascular surgery. Although general surgical techniques originated in the period of antiquity, dominated by Greek and Roman physicians, the modern development of vascular surgery can be divided into three major eras. The first involved indirect surgery with ligation or sympathectomy as common procedures. Era two is the period of direct surgery on arteries and reconstructive surgery. Era three is the era of endovascular surgery, defined as surgery within the lumen of the artery. In the early days of indirect arterial surgery, the primary operative procedures included anastomosis, repair of laceration, and ligation as a common procedure for treatment of aneurysms. During this period, many surgeons were working on anastomosis of arteries. Vascular surgery has two main functions, to stop bleeding and to restore circulation. Ambrose Paré of France is the first surgeon known to use mass ligature to stop bleeding in 1564. Others have suggested the Indian surgeon Sushruta had done ligation before Paré. In 1543, Andreas Versalius published the seven-volume De Humani Corporis Fabrica, a massive contribution to the study of human anatomy, opening the door to the possibility of medical intervention. In 1628, William Harvey expanded the domain of medical knowledge with the publication of On the Motion of the Heart and Blood, the first known description of the dynamics of the circulatory system. In the early days of indirect arterial surgery, the primary operative procedures included anastomosis, repair of laceration, and ligation as a common procedure for treatment of aneurysms. The first repair of a lacerated artery was performed by Hollowell in 1759. He used a metal pin to pinch the edge of the vessel together and tied it with a figure eight suture. In 1785, John Hunter attempted ligation of a large popliteal arterial aneurysm by placing four sutures around the superficial femoral artery. The specimen is still on display at the Royal College of Surgeons Hunterian Museum in London. During this period, many surgeons were experimenting with different techniques of ligation. For restoration of circulation, sympathectomy was often employed and direct surgery on the artery was seldom performed. In 1817, Sir Astley Cooper first ligated the aortic bifurcation for a ruptured left external iliac aneurysm in a 38-year-old man. Rudolf Matas advocated exposing and opening the aneurysm under tourniquet and suturing from within the sac all vessels entering and leaving it. The sac was then obliterated by successive layers of sutures. This technique is known as obliterative endoaneurysmorapy. In 1897, Dr. John B. Murphy of Northwestern University reported his invaginated technique in the first arterial anastomosis in a human. For increase of blood flow, sympathectomy was often the only procedure. In 1899, Dorfler described the essential features of a method using fine round needles and fine silk and continuous sutures embracing all of the coats of the vessel, including penetration of the intima. In the early 1900s, Alex Carell developed the triangulated suture technique. 
Carell won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1912 in recognition of his work on vascular suture and the transplantation of blood vessels and organs. In 1916, Dr. J. McLean discovered heparin, allowing vascular occlusion without distal thrombosis. In the 1940s, the development of heparin was one of the great advances in vascular surgery. In his presidential address, Dr. Ronald Baird told the story of Dr. J. McLean's discovery of heparin and of its clinical use by Dr. Gordon Murray, which Dr. Baird recounted in a 2011 interview with Dr. Walter McCarthy. Uh, the man who's given credit for the first demonstration that you can take a product from a mammalian body and purify it enough that it'll stop the blood from clotting was J. McLean. And he did this at Johns Hopkins Hospital in 1916, and while he was still a medical student. And uh, he wrote it up, but not very clearly. And then he went on to practice in other forms of surgery, radiology, what have you, until uh, in 1937, 38, he begins to read about the work in Toronto where Gordon Murray is using heparin and hooking arteries together. and and uh, that this product is now available and saleable and cheap and uh, he sort of comes out of the woodwork saying and look at this is something I mm -hmm. first discovered 20 30 years ago now he goes looking for credit with the person he first worked with which was professor Howell at uh, Johns Hopkins so Howell was a very important man and he'd made the contributions and he put the name heparin on this substance. He tried to produce it from dog liver, and he did, but it wasn't very good and it wasn't very much. And it was only when the Charles Best, who had worked with banding in Toronto, got interested in it that they decided they could get it from calf, uh, cattle liver originally, and then finally pig guts. Mm -hmm. Most of our heparin today comes from uh, porcine uh, intestine. It became, uh, of course, very ubiquitous in its use, and McLean uh, would like to get credit, but Howell didn't think he had contributed all that much, so he felt he was not well treated at Hopkins, and McLean wanted more credit, which he never got in his lifetime. He died in 48, just when he was about to present a paper on the discovery of heparin. Died of a heart attack. In 1929, the first translumbar aortogram was performed by Dr. Reynaldo dos Santos, providing the first diagnostic roadmap for vascular surgeons. World War I and II brought advances in anesthesia, blood transfusion, and the treatment of shock. In 1947, aortoiliac thromboendarterectomy was pioneered by Sid dos Santos, René Leriche, and Jack Wiley, an effective treatment for aortoiliac occlusive disease without requiring a graft. In 1949, Jean Coulin reported the first successful series of reverse saphenous vein grafting for the correction of femoral popliteal occlusive disease. During the Korean War, vascular repair succeeded ligation, resulting in limb salvage rather than amputation for vascular trauma. This was a concept championed by Dr. Michael DeBakey. In 1951, DuBost performed the first direct aneurysm repair using a homograft. In the 1950s, arterial sclerosis was recognized as the primary process responsible for arterial occlusive disease. This was a giant step forward. In 1952, Voorhees developed the first prosthetic graft. In 1953, carotid endarterectomy was pioneered by Michael DeBakey. Dr. Felix Eastcott was another early practitioner of the technique, which prevented countless strokes. Dr. Charles Robb popularized the procedure at St. Mary's Hospital in London as early as 1954. In 1953, the development of the heart-lung machine by Gibbon gave rise to the specialty of cardiothoracic surgery. In 1970, cardiothoracic surgery was recognized as a specialty. The creation of this new path of treatment is the moment when vascular surgery as a species first stood erect. The Society for Vascular Surgery was founded by 31 general surgeons with an interest in vascular surgery. Under the leadership of Dr. Ross Veal, the Society held its organizational meeting on July the 3rd, 1946, 
at the Fairmont Hotel, San Francisco. It was decided that the first annual meeting of the Society for Vascular Surgery would be held at the Dennis Hotel in Atlantic City on June the 8th, 1947. A slate of officers was chosen as follows. President Alton Oxner, Vice President Emil Holman, Secretary J. Ross Veal, Recorder Geza de Takets. The meeting at the Dennis Hotel featured nine presentations, mostly on Venus topics. There is a striking difference between the 1947 and 2011 program booklets. One page in 1947 versus 298 pages in 2011. Three surgical giants take in the Atlantic City boardwalk. Geza de Takets, Michael DeBakey, and Alton Oxner. On the occasion of the 50th anniversary of SVS, Dr. Michael DeBakey and Dr. Harris B. Schumacher were the only remaining founding members. Dr. DeBakey lived to be nearly 100. He developed an aortic dissection, a disorder he originally classified years earlier. He was operated on by Dr. George Noon, survived the operation, and died months later. His own operative schedule was legendarily booked solid for decades. Dr. Craig Miller came across notes on DeBakey's activities on a typical day at Houston Methodist Hospital while doing research on Dr. Robert Zollinger, March 26, 1974. Six coronary bypasses, one mitral valve replacement, three triple A's, one carotid endarterectomy, one popliteal aneurysm repair, one AKA, two angios, a typical Tuesday. Besides inventing the roller pump device used in the heart-lung machine, Dr. DeBakey organized a medical center on a sleepy swamp in Texas, making HMH into an international powerhouse of vascular surgery. In the 1950s, he pioneered the Dacron vascular graft and the DeBakey aneurysm clamp, performed the first carotid endarterectomy as well as the first arch aneurysm replacement. In the 1960s, he championed the bypass principle and paved the way for greater international exchange. His primary emphasis to the hundreds of residents and fellows was attention to detail. All the while, he produced a massive list of publications on a wide variety of topics. He authored the greatest number of peer-reviewed articles of anyone in the field. He institutionalized this activity with the founding of the Journal of Vascular Surgery. His war experience drove him to develop the concept of vascular surgery as a specialty beginning with the creation of vascular centers for arterial repair after World War II and the MASH unit during the Korean War. In his interview with Dr. Bill Blaisdell, Dr. DeBakey explained the factors that brought about the development of vascular surgery as a surgical specialty, referring to a study he authored with Dr. Simeone. We're interested in uh your appraisal of how Society for Vascular Surgery came about. It came about to some extent because of the war experience. Uh, as you know, during the war, during World War II, um, there was a very high incidence of amputations from major, from major arterial injuries in the, lower, in the extremities, both in the upper and lower extremities. So that repair, a vascular repair, uh, was not very successful, but that actually it was not successful because it wasn't tried very much. You may recall that Simeone and I did an analysis uh, of, of arterial injuries during World War II in which we published our experience showing a very high incidence of, of lack of doing vascular surgery. However, vascular surgery became sort of important in these vascular injuries subsequently in the patients who developed arterial venous fistulae. And we had, uh, we set up what we call vascular centers. Together with Dr. Daniel Elkin, Dr. DeBakey published a book on vascular injuries in World War II. Under their direction, three vascular centers were established to treat and follow patients with vascular injuries. Dan Elkin was head of one of them, as a matter of fact, in, in, uh, in the Greenbrier area. And uh, Harry Schumacher was assigned to one of them in, 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 in Indiana. So we set up, we had to set up these centers uh, immediately at the end of the war to take care of the wounded that came back. Well, now people hadn't really trained in vascular no, surgery. No, that's right. They so were, you, were, you were involved in, 
encouraging people, I guess, exactly. especially. This stimulated the idea that vascular surgery should, should be a kind of a specialty. This statement inspired the leaders in vascular surgery to pursue the establishment of vascular surgery as a surgical specialty. Dr. DeBakey was honored by three presidents and in 2008 he was awarded the Congressional Gold Medal, the highest honor bestowed by the U.S. Congress. A stern taskmaster who maximized his time, he demanded even more of himself. He was always at the center of a flurry of activity. There were so many things he wanted to accomplish. Dr. DeBakey touched every aspect of vascular surgery during the course of his life and will be an influence for years to come. His leadership and international view of vascular surgery had an impact on all of humanity. A committee was formed to plan the celebration of 50 years of SVS. The committee, co-chaired by Dr. Calvin Ernst and James Yao, planned an exhibit featuring 50 years of advances in vascular surgery. Doctors William Pierce and James Yao designed the exhibit, including six panels covering surgical technique, diagnostic technology, arterial grafts, devices, research, and education. Dr. John Mannock stands next to a display featuring the first 50 presidents of the SVS. A special issue of the Journal of Vascular Surgery covering the Society's 50-year history was co-edited by Drs. Calvin Ernst and James Yao. Leaders in the specialty wrote 17 chapters covering activities of the SVS from 1984 to 1996. On June the 11th, 1996, a celebration was held featuring interviews of Drs. DeBakey and Schumacher by Drs. Blaisdell and Ernst. Dr. Frank Veith presented a handmade gavel made by Dr. Jonathan Town to the two surviving founders. In the area of the Society's finances, Dr. Schumacher told Dr. Cal Ernst about his first transaction as treasurer. And we used to have a luncheon which uh, constituted the executive session. Well, there wasn't much business to transact, and so we had wonderful stories, uh, Cajun stories from Al Oxner, and if Mems Gage was there, there were even better ones. The way I kept the treasury uh, during those early years was really quite simple. We didn't have any money, we didn't have a bank account, and um, we had no expenses uh, except the lunch. So we would uh, have lunch and I'd call the waiter over and ask what the bill was and add a tip and divide it by the number of people who were sitting around the table and uh, uh, reach a figure that would cover the um, cost of the lunch and the tip and pick up someone's hat, because I never had a hat, and walk around the table and ask each person to put in it the, two dollars and seventy-five cents or four twenty-one whatever it was and I'd give that money to the waiter so now the treasury had uh, a zero balance. Again. You had no problems with the IRS back no, when they take no, it. <laughs> In 2011, by comparison, the annual budget of SVS was $7 million, which also has a net worth of $7 million.